Adamic Covenant last week. We've actually taken a couple of weeks to look at the Adamic Covenant. Tonight we're going to move out of that and move uh, toward the Noahic Covenant. Well, we'll hop on that here in a second. We'll do that here in just a second. It is a good question. It's a very good question. All right, well, let's pray and we'll get started tonight. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here. We love you and we thank you for your love for us. Lord, uh, we are indebted to you uh, because of your grace. And uh, we just want to learn more of your word so that we can align our will with yours. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, we, we looked at the uh, Edenic Covenant and the Adamic Covenant. Now we're coming out of the Adamic Covenant. And uh, the terms of the Adamic Covenant are both positive and negative. Uh, in the uh, Adamic Covenant, we looked at Genesis 3.15, where God makes a prophetic announcement that he is going to redeem his creation. And he doesn't give a lot of detail about it. Uh, that's going to be unfolded through all of the other covenants and all of the other scripture. The curses we're pretty familiar with uh, that God made. God gave a, a curse. He pronounced a curse uh, upon the, uh, the serpent. And what was that curse? Yeah, he would crawl on his belly and eat dust all of his days. Uh, he then uh, pronounces a curse upon uh, Satan. And what is that? That's found in Genesis 3.15, by the way. What is the curse on Satan? Exactly, that ultimately he would be destroyed, right? Okay. Uh, and then there's a curse placed upon the woman. What are the curses that are placed upon the woman? Yeah, she would experience uh, pain in childbirth, and uh, she would also struggle uh, with subjection to her husband. All right, boy, Jack likes that one. All right, all right. What, whatever, you whatever you attempt to drag me into, you will not succeed. All right, all right. <laughs> uh, and then, <laughs> and then uh, what was the curse for uh, Adam? There, curse upon work. Work is not the curse, okay? Work is not a curse. There was a curse upon the work. And that is that there would be thorns and thistles upon the earth, that he would work by the sweat of his brow to produce food, okay? And so uh, that's kind of where, where we end uh, with that. When you come into Genesis chapter 4, we're introduced to the fact that Adam and Eve uh, have their first son. His name is Cain, and uh, Cain uh, is then followed by another son. His name is Abel, okay? Uh, there is a, uh, a, an issue that occurs between Cain and Abel, and what is that particular issue? All right, yeah, and the issue of the sacrifice, yeah, the issue of sacrifice, uh, God rejects the sacrifice of Cain, he accepts the sacrifice of Seth, and in his jealousy and anger at his brother, the first murder occurs, and he murders his brother, a curse is placed upon Cain, and Cain now goes out. Uh, away from his uh, family, uh, Adam uh, and Eve. They have another son. I know I'm marching through this quickly because this is just information as it leads to another covenant. Uh, they have another son, and his name is Seth, right? Seth is the father of a very godly legacy, a godly lineage, uh, and uh, he is uh, honorable to God. And from there, you have some of the uh, well-known patriarchs that come from uh, Seth, uh, such as Enoch and Methuselah, uh, you have Noah who comes from this godly lineage. Now, we don't know how long, but there are, we, we, we have some idea about how many hundreds and hundreds of years pass between uh, the uh, birth of Cain and Abel and ultimately Seth, and then from Seth uh, to uh, his descendant Noah but it's plenty of time for the earth to be populated with people, okay? And um, uh, the scriptures give us some insight into some things that I want to draw attention to before we get to Noah. You'll remember when God uh, told Adam and Eve in the Edenic Covenant that uh, you can eat of any fruit of the tree uh, in the garden. You can eat of the tree of life, but of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you will surely die. 
So death would come upon creation. And the New Testament really amplifies that in Paul's writings in Romans chapter 5. But I want you to see how the historical account of death coming upon the human race is mentioned in Genesis chapter 5. If you will, let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 5. Genesis 5, 1 says, This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and he blessed them, and he called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And that's interesting because we oftentimes say that God created Adam and Eve. But if you look at the scriptures closely, it wasn't God who gave Eve her name, it was Adam. All right, God calls them both Adam, right? And uh, they are both Adam and they are male and they are female, okay? That's very important in our culture today, all right? Uh, It's important because the Bible is giving us a correct worldview. And it's important for us to have a concrete worldview. Biblical instruction, sound doctrine gives us a correct worldview. In this one issue alone, the world has tremendous confusion right now, okay? And uh, God has clearly stated that he has created them male and female, all right? How many times have we heard that in just the first five chapters that he made them male and female? Uh, The scriptures go on to tell us, uh, verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness. That's important. Because Adam was created in God's likeness, but now the offspring that is going to come from Adam and Eve uh, is going to be made in Adam's likeness, not God's. That is significant because we inherit an Adamic nature. Again, a correct worldview. If we believe that we are here by luck, if we believe that we're here by chance, if we believe we're here by evolution, not only do we destroy a creative narrative, and not only do we destroy an opportunity to understand that there is a God and that he is sovereign over creation, but we also lose the fact that we are sinners by nature and need a Savior. Okay? That's why these storylines are important. It's why we got to get kids in church. Pray with me. Pray with me. Pray with me that we will have a large number of young families come to Oasis so that we can teach their children. Get your grandchildren here. It is critical that we teach children what Genesis' account of creation is because they're going into a secular society that wants to draw them away from this. And as a result, they're going to have tremendous confusion about who they are and who God is and what the world is all about. Very important that we, that we do that. And, and again, in verse 3, it says, And Adam lived 130 years. He begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and he called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he begat Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. Now, immediately people attack that and go, Well, that's just absurd. That doesn't really mean what it means. It absolutely means what it means. And the reason that we can believe this is the world in which pre-flood humans lived is not the same world that you and I live in, all right? It was, it was more, and I don't want to get too far ahead, but it was more than it rained 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible tells us that, yes, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but it says that the fountains of the deep were broken up, and that helped flood the world. And there was also a canopy around the world that collapsed and it brought water down upon the earth. You you couldn't get enough rain for 40 days and 40 nights under normal circumstances to flood the the world. And I don't want to get too far ahead, but the flood is universal. It wasn't a localized flood. It wasn't a regional flood. It is a universal flood. Okay? And that's how all of the water got here. But people lived in a world in which... Things such as radiation from the sun, aging components were not the same as they are today. Tremendous change occurred in the world 
in the earth and, and our universe when the flood came. Uh, again, we'll talk more about that shortly. But here's the three words I want you to identify. And if you have your Bible, uh, you can highlight this or underline it. Uh, if you're taking notes, write it down. God said, the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will surely die. And you say, well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he died 930 years later. No, he died immediate, immediately spiritually. Death is separation. So he's separated from God now, so he died spiritually immediately. And you go into a dispensation of conscience. There's no law that's written down, but God has put his law in their hearts. Men know what is right and wrong by what God has put in their hearts. Our founding fathers called this natural law. Okay? And God is the one who put that in human hearts. Now, we can disobey God to the point that we sear our conscience, and we can also disobey God to the point, the world can, where, where we have people who have a reprobate mind. But they don't begin that way. God gives them the law, uh, his law written in their hearts. Plus, we have the Word of God now, which gives us further evidence of God's will for our lives. But though he died spiritually in a moment, it takes 930 years for him to die physically, but he does die physically. What are the last three words of verse 5? And he died. Now, keep going. In verse 8, it says, And all the days of Seth were 912 years, what? And he died. Go to verse 11. And all the days of Enos were 905 years, what? And he died. Verse 14, and all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Uh, 17, and all the days of Mahuliel uh, were 890 and five years, and he died. Uh, verse 20, and all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Uh, and then uh, go down to verse 24, uh, Enoch uh, walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, wait, there's something that changes here. Now, all of a sudden, you have somebody who lives for so many years and he doesn't die. He is what? Translated, right? He's, he's, just, he's in fellowship with God. And the way Howard Hendricks used to describe it is, Enoch and God were having a conversation and they walked a long ways. And uh, after they walked a while, it was getting late in the day. And Enoch said, well, God, I need to turn around and get home. It's about to get dark. And God said to Enoch, what? Hey, we're closer to my house than to your house. Just come home with me. Now, I don't know if it happened that way or not, but it makes a great storyline, right? So what's he do? He doesn't die in that sense. He what? He is translated, right, uh, and, and all. So uh, there's a type there, but we don't have time to go into that. Then Methuselah comes around. Methuselah lives 969 years, what? And he died. He was the oldest man to ever live, 969 years. And what's interesting is his name, Methuselah, means when he dies, it shall come. Now, I don't want to build a lot into this, but I'll just go ahead and give you the, the sticking point for you. And it's this, that the year in which Methuselah died is the year that the flood came. So it's a prophecy of coming judgment. You can go to the book of Jude. Methuselah was the son of Enoch. And Enoch, no doubt, poured into his son the prophetic word of God that judgment was going to come. If you go into Jude, it tells you about the prophecy of Enoch. So Enoch, in his fellowship with God, would come home and tell his family what God was telling him. And so apparently he tells Methuselah, I named you Methuselah as a prophetic reminder to you and to everybody, in the year that you die, judgment will come. Now it doesn't say judgment, but with the prophetic references in Jude, we know that's what he's referring to. And so in the year that he dies, and he died at 969 years, uh, he, he, uh, the, the flood comes. And then it says that Lamech lived 182 years. He began a son, and his name was Noah, okay? And then verse 31 says, and all the days of Lamech were 777 years. Isn't that interesting? 777 years, okay? So he has a son, uh, Noah, the most famous of his sons, and he died. And then it says, and Noah lived 500 years, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so all of a sudden you covered hundreds of years of human history through the godly legacy. There are two seventh from Adams that are mentioned in the book of Genesis. Write this down for your own reading, your own edification. There are two seventh from Adams, okay? One comes from the descendants of Cain, 
seven generations, his name is Lamech. There is another seventh from Seth, which is Enoch. Enoch and Lamech are contemporaries. That means they lived at the same time. One, Enoch walks with God. He's in fellowship with God. God's sharing his heart with him and, 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 and sharing his love with him and, and, and all of that. And he prepares his family for a coming judgment. Lamech, on the other hand, is recorded in the book of Genesis. All you have to do is go back into chapter 4 and you see it. Lamech is the first man to marry more than one wife. He's a polygamist. Not only is he a polygamist, but he's a murderer. Not only is he a murderer, but he's boastful about his murder. And he is the head of what? A godless generation. If you want to know how the world got to the condition that it was in that caused judgment to come, it's because the world was populated from what? The ungodly side of Lamech, who was what? Godless. And those are the ones that are being judged. The family of Enoch, who will be Noah, they're the ones that are saved. God's going to offer grace through Noah. By the way, if you'll just keep looking ahead, and we'll look at it a little bit later, Noah is an ancestor of Abram. And God's going to make a special covenant with Abram, okay? There's a godly lineage, okay? Boy, we could, we could just stay right there. How important it is for us to pass our faith and our walk with God on to our children. And listen to me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you've made mistakes and you've come to repentance, pour that into your children. I'm not, you don't have to give them all the details. I'm not going to give my children all the details. But I want to let them know that God is a God of mercy and a God of grace. If you get off the road, get back on the road. And not just for you, but your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids, right? It's important for us to pass on a godly heritage and a godly lineage. Now, in chapter 6, uh, it says, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took with them wives of all which they chose. Now, you've heard me teach a little bit on this, and uh, if you'll jump down to verse 4, it says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men and were uh, of old men of renown. There's a lot of opinions as about what that means. I have kind of tended to lean into the fact that these are uh, demonic spirits who have cohabitated with uh, women, physical women, and they have created an all, uh, a hybrid human race, okay? That's why they're giants, okay? They've morphed into something else. Now, there are those who disagree with that and say, no, 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 all it refers to is that the sons, uh, the sons of men refer to the descendants of Cain, and the, uh, the, the daughters uh, who are the sons of God, uh, they married, who are the descendants of Seth, they intermarried with them, and so you've got, you know, an ungodly race or an ungodly group of people marrying a godly people. Well, to me, that kind of doesn't answer the question of why they became giants. Something happened. Something significant happened. And, and that, along with, again, with the book of Jude, Jude talks about that these angels, I believe, well, he does say the word angels, says that they left their former estate. In other words, they were with God, but they were cast out of heaven, and they you know, committed fornication. That's, that's the word that's used there. They committed fornication. So there's some type of sexual sin that's involved here in my understanding. And so here you have, you have just godless society uh, on the earth that's just doing great wickedness, but you're also having a disruption of the normal human cycle, which I think is Satan's attempt to stop the coming of the Messiah, the Savior into the world, because the Savior has to be what? A man. Right? We talked about that. Why, why did Jesus have to become a man? Well, because the first Adam failed and sinned. Eve was in him uh, and under his authority as the federal head. So God needed to send another head into the world, the last Adam, which is Jesus. This one was created by God. This one is not procreated by a man and a woman. Right? Jesus isn't procreated by a man and a woman. She was a virgin. And the seed was planted by the Holy Spirit and produced the offspring, 
okay? So you have, what, a creation here and a creation here, a fallen creation, but a righteous creation, right? And then he redeems, he redeems the world. Verse 5 says of chapter 6, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now read verse 8. Yeah, but Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. God is going to introduce grace into a mess in order to salvage his purposes to bring a savior into the world, all right? Uh, and um, we'll keep going here. Uh, the Bible tells us that God told him about an ark, you need to build this boat, uh, it's going to rain uh, on, on the earth um, and flood the earth. And uh, if you'll go to chapter 7, verse 1. By the way, uh, how long did it take him to build the ark? 120 years, and not only was he building the ark for 120 years, but he was preaching for 120 years, and what was he preaching? Repentance, judgment's coming, repent, repent. What did people do? They scoffed at him, they laughed at him, you know, uh, thought he was just, you know, foolish in, in what he had, but notice in chapter 7, verse 1, and the Lord said unto Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by what? Seven. So of the clean animals, and these were animals that were dedicated to sacrifice, of the clean and animals they could eat, uh, these you're to bring onto the ark. You're going to have seven of them. And he says, the male and the female. The beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Okay. Of the fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the floods of the waters was upon the earth. Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives. How many were there? Eight. That'll be important. Verse 9, And there went in two, uh, and two unto Noah, into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah, came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And then you have how it rained for... You know, I think uh, verse 12, 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, you can read more here about how uh, the flood was universal. Um, three things I want you to write down about the flood, because it's going to be important to the Noahic covenant. The flood was universal. It was not until the 1830s that you began to hear that the flood was not universal, that it was a localized flood. Because scientists were trying to explain rock formations. And their opinion was the only way this could have occurred is through millions and millions and millions of years. But you don't need millions and millions and millions of years if you have something climactic happen on the face of the earth. Well, the Bible tells us what happened. There was a massive flood, not just rain for 40 days and 40 nights, but a canopy of water that fell upon the earth and what? Fountains of the deep that are broken up. It's reshaping the earth. You don't have to have millions of years of that. You've got water that is moving and eroding and great power that is taking place, all right? Yeah, and the pressures. Yeah, the pressures that are associated with it. And so, again, don't, don't let somebody try to intimidate you with that, okay? The flood is very significant in, in human uh, history, all right? 
And it was so massive, verse uh, 20 uh, tells us of chapter 7, that 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. So the tallest mountains on the earth were what? Covered by 15 cubits of water. Now, how, how much is a cubit? About 18 inches, okay? Somebody multiply 15 times 18. All I have to do is take up the offering. That's the only math I do. All right, how much? Okay, so uh, you're talking about 90 inches. So if that's, if that's the case, 90 inches, how many feet is that? Okay, in other words, there, there's water that has covered the earth. Yeah, if our Mount Everest today, 29,000 feet or whatever, and it covers that up by 15 cubits. Okay, so get the idea. It's a universal flood. If it's a localized flood, it can't do that. Okay, but it's universal. It's visible. Okay, it's universal and it's visible. Very important to understand. And I'll tie that into the covenant here in a minute. Okay, so uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 8, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. A very interesting play on words there, And God remembered Noah, because what does Noah's name mean? God remembers God remembers, so God remembered Noah, right? Now, you're going to have the flood has what? The flood has come, and the, the flood has gone. And the ark, yes. It's actually only two. I said three, but it's only two. But I will get to three when I get to the covenant. But anyway, there's only two. No, no, no. There's only two on that one, but there's three coming up. Okay, all right. But thank you for asking. Uh, so the flood uh, has dissipated. We know the story of how he sent out the dove and he sent out the raven and, and all of that. We're not going to take time to look at that tonight. But it says that when he came off the ark, verse 20 says, this is chapter 8, Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, Noah built an ark unto the Lord and he took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Now, you've had in the creation story that God created the moon and the sun and the stars. But now you're going to have something you haven't had before, and what is it? Seasons. Why was there not a need for seasons before the flood? You had the, the canopy. The canopy worked like a hyperbaric chamber. Okay? We're like a hyperbaric chamber, okay? So it slows down what? Radiation slows down decay, right? It's life-producing. Increases growth, the oxygen levels are at the right level, you got all of that. So, so this was the world, but when the canopy fell, then what do you have here? Well, now there's a need for seasons, okay? And that's going to be important as we play into this, okay? Verse uh, chapter uh, 9, verse 1, and God bless Noah. This is going to sound very familiar in some ways to what God said to Adam and Eve when he created them with a few distinctions. Chapter 9 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Eight people come off of the ark. Why eight? Why not just Noah and his wife? Why eight? Well, to do that, yeah, because races are going to come out of this. But remember, biblically, the number eight in, in Scripture Eight is, has the numeric value of new beginnings. New beginnings. What do we have on the earth? You have a new beginning. You have Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives. There are eight. They come off of the ark, and they're told by God. God says, I'm going to bless you. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply, fill the earth. And now he's starting to tell us a little bit about 
some of the changes that have occurred. These changes didn't occur until after the flood. For example, you may have a question, okay? You may have the question that says, well, how in the world did, did Noah get every animal that's on the earth today on the ark because it's not big enough? He didn't have to get every animal that is on the earth today. Because we know that what? As species blend and merge and all of that, we produce more and things of that nature. It wasn't a matter of getting everything that's here today. It was basically to get the animals that were necessary to be able to repopulate the earth back on the earth. Now the question may be, well, how did he get them? I mean, that, wouldn't that be something that would require a whole lot of time? And wouldn't that be something? I mean, how many animals want to come up to him and all of that? Notice verse uh, 2. Verse 2 says, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth on the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. So what did God put in the nature of the animals after the flood? Be a fear of man. There wasn't a fear of man before. There wasn't a fear because man didn't eat animals. God told them that they were to eat only of what? The herbs and the fruits of the tree. That didn't change after Adam fell. That's what they ate. There was a continuity in the relationship between animals and people. But now that changes because God says, I have delivered them up into your hand. Every moving thing that liveth shall be what? Meat for you, even as the green herb, I have given you all things. So what? Now you can eat the animals. But in order to protect the animals... I'm going to put fear of you upon them. So now you're going to have to do what? Now you've got to hunt them. Okay? But you're, you're going to be able to eat them. Okay? Uh, it says in verse 4, there is a prohibition, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, thou shalt not eat. So God says you can eat of the animals, and you can eat of the herbs and the vegetables and the fruits that, that I have put on the earth. I want you to enjoy those things, but don't eat the blood. Okay? Now, uh, something else that he adds to this. Verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So what's, what's the next thing that God now institutes? Government will come out of this, but also if you murder, what are the consequences? Capital punishment. I'm in verse uh, 6 of chapter 9, Genesis 9, 6. So here, here's what God does. God promised favor upon Noah and his family that he would be benevolent to them. He gave them instructions to be fruitful and to multiply. He gave them still authority over all of the creatures. They can even eat them now. Now, go over to verse, uh, back to chapter 8, verse 21. What does God promise there? Right, right. Notice also chapter 9, verse 11, and verse 15. Actually, we'll read through that. Verse 11 says, this is Genesis 9, 11 says, And I will establish my covenant with you. Now, notice this. This is a very significant covenant. God is always the initiator of covenant, okay? But here God is going to offer a common grace. God's going to offer a common grace, not only to believers but to unbelievers. This is God's covenant. I want you to pay attention to whom God makes this covenant with, okay? Verse 11, and I will establish my covenant with you, Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, 
This is the token of the covenant. Remember, covenants have three things. They have words. We've been reading those. Uh, the words, blood. The blood comes from the altar that he makes a sacrifice uh, in chapter 8, verse 20. And there's always a symbol or a token, a sign. Verse 12, and God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you. And what? and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Okay, now pay attention to this. God offers what? Common grace to all of his creation. It's not just with Noah, not just with Noah's family. It's to every human being on the planet. Not only every human being on the planet, but to what? Every animal. Fish, bird, dolphin, cow, Probably not cats. All right. All right. Here's the three things. The covenant that God puts up is what? What's the, what's the sign? A rainbow. We'll talk about that in a second. But the rainbow has three aspects to it. It's universal. We don't just have rainbows in Texas. We don't just have rainbows in the United States. I've seen rainbows in the Philippines. I've seen them in Eastern Europe. I've seen them in Mexico. I've seen them all over the world, right? They're universal, okay? That way every man sees it. God's speaking to them, right? And so it's universal. Uh, it is visible. You can see it. And number three, it's perpetual. It's not just for my generation, it wasn't just for my dad or my grandfather's generation. It's from Noah until the end of the world. It's a perpetual, what, reminder of God's covenant. And it's a universal covenant with Noah and all of the human race and all of the created order and all of the earth. And it was this, God said, I will never again flood the earth with waters. And he says in verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a, a, for a token of a covenant between me and what? The earth. And God's the initiator of this because he's the one who brings the clouds. He's the one who produces the rainbow. He's the one who's communicating to all of, his, of the earth, verse 15, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said to Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Have you ever wondered why a rainbow? Of all the things that God have, could have chosen, why did he choose a rainbow? Yeah, it's universal. It's universal. All right. So said it with rain, sure. Yeah, it's visible to everybody. Why does he call it a bow? What is, when you think of bow, what do you think of? Maybe you think of like putting a little bow in your daughter's hair or whatever. Right, okay, that's not it. A bow and arrow, okay? What does it look like? From our perspective, what does it look like? It looks like a bow, doesn't it? I mean, imagine a string running here, and here's the, the bow, right? Okay. How is the bow facing? It's not faced toward the earth. You see, God's not going to attack the earth with water again. He's got a what? A rainbow, but it faces heaven. He's not going to judge again. That's why it's a bow. That's not, he's not going to execute judgment like that. But, but let's, let's see what we can do to try to pull something out of this that is significant for us and for the time in which we live. It's a great story. 
it's probably one of the earliest stories those of us who were raised in church remember. But the significance of this is enormous when we consider worldview. Whether you're aware of it or not, you have a worldview. We all have a worldview. How we view the world, how we view ourselves, how we view God, how we view time, how we view eternity. We all have a worldview. And if it's not established in biblical truth, the only other place it can come is from the world. And, and the world doesn't have a biblical worldview. Therefore, its paradigm, how it sees things, is distorted. That's why, for example, not only Adam and the Adamic covenant, but the uh, Noahic covenant is so important to teach our children. Well, here's something that I learned in this. There are several things that I learned in this. And the first thing is that God is sovereign, that God is in control. And not only is he in control of human history, but God is ultimately in control of what? Creation. That's good news and bad news. It was bad news for a generation who refused to trust him and obey him and believe him because he used what? His creation to punish them. But there's also some good news in this because There's a constant reminder, go to verse uh, 22 of chapter 8 again, Genesis 8, 22, and he says, while the earth remaineth. While the earth remaineth. I'm not worried about global warming. I'm not worried about climate change. But the world, Now, there are those who use that politically for financial gain and for political power. But there are genuinely millions of people on the earth that are worried about what's going to happen. And and our governments on the earth spend trillions of dollars to do what? To, To send spacecraft out into the world to the universe to look for what life you know not too long ago uh one of our uh cameras satellites went out and it got as far as uh saturn and one of the things that they discovered to the excitement of scientists is that there was actually under the surface of the rings of saturn was actually water. What what does that matter to people? Because if you have water, you can have life. If you don't have water, you can't have life. And and, and here's the thing, we we ridicule it in some ways and we snicker at it, but here's a world who's afraid and scared that something's going to happen, that we're going to so abuse the creation that you know climate change is going to occur and we can't live here. We've got to find somewhere else to live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we're desperate. I mean, people are desperate to, to try to salvage, you know, what we have here. And, and, and we'll talk more about our responsibility to that uh, here, here in just a second. But when he says here, while the earth remaineth, this planet is going to be here until God's purposes are fulfilled. He's not only the creator, he's the sustainer. All things have their existence because of him. And according to the book of Colossians, Jesus Christ himself sustains all things. And the great thing about this God that we have, that God is sovereign, he's created our world to have order. Shouldn't surprise us, the creator has order. That's why he tells the church at Corinth, do all things decently and in order. We're to imitate him. And God does all things decently and in order. And he's created the world to be orderly. What's he say here? Sea time and harvest. Cold and heat. Summer and winter. Day and night. Guess what I know is going to happen tomorrow morning? Sun's coming up. 
What's going to happen about 7.30 tonight? Sun's going to go down. Now, we know it doesn't do that. That's phenomenologically what it does. We know we're spinning and all that. But you know the concept, sunrise, sunset. How long has it been doing that? Okay? How long is it going to do it? Until God finishes whatever he's going to finish with it. It has order. You can count on it. Not only that, but guess what? We have an idea of when it's going to be hot. Man, I enjoyed today. Did you enjoy today? I enjoyed today. I'm not too much on August. But I know what's coming in August. Yeah, the heat's coming. Uh, I know what's going to come in February when February rolls around. And matter of fact, we know that the world has so much order, we even put it into our conversations with each other. For example, man, it's unseasonably cold. It's unseasonably hot. Why do we say that? We know there's order. Where does the order come from? There's God. And God is sovereign. And God created. And God sustains it. And he put order here. There's a time to plant. There's a time to reap. If, if you plant too soon, or you plant too late, how do, how do we know that? that? That's God's order. This is His, what, common grace for everybody. Whether, whether you're saved or lost, you experience the common grace. I mean, even in things like hurricanes. Think about how much better prepared we are for hurricanes. We even have a certain conversation that we have about it. We call it hurricane season. We have a good idea when it's going to come and when it's going to stop, and we kind of generally know, and because of what? The technology and some understanding that we have, now we're able to save, what, thousands and thousands and thousands of lives because we can tell you, what, a week in advance, get ready, Hurricane Rita is going to come. What is that? That's common grace. Now, when Rita comes and hits the Gulf Coast, there's localized flood. That's why I know it's a universal flood. Because if there's a localized flood, and that's only what God was referring to, then he needs to take the rainbow away because he's a liar. Right? If it was only a localized flood, then God's lied to us. Because I know there's been lots of floods. Ask the people in Houston. Remember a couple of years ago? Right? We went down to Houston after the uh, uh, hurricane was there. That hurricane came in. They were thinking it was going to come and pass over and go like that. But that hurricane stayed about four days. And it just circled, and it's getting what? Gulf moisture, and it's just flooding Houston. And we went, we got us a truck, a big box truck, and got some friends who donated a bunch of stuff, and we drove down there and gave them to a preacher friend of mine in the inner city, Houston, and, and loved on them. But it was amazing to see the damage. But still, we know what? It's hurricane season. How's there just a season? Why didn't one just pop up? Yeah, exactly. But it's common grace. God set that in order. So what do I learn from this story? I learned, first of all, that what? God is sovereign. I also learned that God is what? Benevolent. He's benevolent. He's kind. The, the third thing here is I know there's a coming judgment because there's already been one. It won't be the same. This one's going to come by fire. God gave Noah 120 years to prepare the world. We've had ever since then, but let's just bring it in a little closer. We've had the gospel through Jesus Christ for 2,000 years. You thought 969 years with Methuselah was a long time. When he dies, it shall come. Well, now we're at, what, 2,000 years of human history in which, what, the gospel is being presented to people. Yes, there is coming judgment. It won't be the same, but there is coming judgment. Now, those are the things that I learned from that. Are there any things that you guys are learning? Let me very quickly, before we get out of here, there's some things we need to talk before we get into this because it builds toward the uh, Abrahamic covenant. From the three sons of Noah, the earth was repopulated and divided into families and languages, lands, and nations. 
You get that in Genesis chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. If you want to write these down, it's important. Uh, you have Sham. Sham was to be a blessed race. Having Canaan as his servant and being a blessing to Japheth. The biblical history of this is the nation of Israel. From Sham comes Abraham. Not directly, but through progression of generations. Abram comes from this line, and ultimately, Abram has Isaac, and Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. He has sons, and they are the 12 tribes of Israel. It is going to be through this nation that the Savior of the world comes. And there's going to be a special blessing through Sham to the world, particularly to those of Japheth. Now, Ham. You have Ham, Sham, and Japheth. You have Ham. What happened with Ham and Noah? Okay. The Bible tells us that after, sometime after Noah and his family got off of the ark, Noah plants a vineyard. And he gets intoxicated. He makes wine and he gets intoxicated. Noah was affected by the sin of his son Ham, and so Ham, as a father, was judged in his son. The father was affected by the son of the sin, therefore the curse came upon what? The son of the son who affected Noah. That's Canaan. Canaan is the son of Ham. He was to be cursed. He would be a servant of servants, both to Sham and to Japheth. What do, you, what do you think the sin was? Yeah. Some think he saw his father naked, because it does say that he saw his father's nakedness. Saw his father's nakedness, and that was the curse. I think that's a little harsh for just seeing nakedness. Uh, some believe it was something homosexual. All right. It could have been, but if you look in the book of Leviticus, it condemns looking upon the nakedness of your mother. It could be the fact that there was an incestuous relationship between Noah's wife and this son. I don't know, but whatever it was, it was severe enough that there is a curse that's pronounced upon the descendants of Canaan, Canaan himself and, and his descendants. Because the sin was so severe. Whatever it was that God saw it, it was so severe. Sexual sin is very serious, by the way. Look at the Old Testament law concerning sexual sin. And we, we, don't, we don't think too much about that in our society today because we're so lascivious. But... You know, the thing is, it never, it never stays just where it's at. It always degrades, right? Look at, look at what we're doing today. Um, do not simply th think of the Negro when you read this curse. There are those who tried to justify slavery because of this. The son of Ham was Canaan. He is the father of what? The Canaanites. All right, who are the Canaanites? Pe people who lived in the land of Canaan when they went across the Jordan River. So we have to be very careful not to try to justify the sin of slavery with a biblical text. The Bible never 
condones slavery. This is the reality of the curse. Now, uh, go ahead. Well, if I, I would have to define those terms. If you're a servant and you're paid, it's different than being a slave and having no rights. You can be a servant and have rights. You know, you could be a maid or a butler and, yeah, yeah, you know. But if you're a slave, I own you. You're a piece of property, right? Yeah, yeah, you don't have a choice in the matter, right? Okay. Right, right. And, Yeah, it, under the Old Testament law, if you, if you got into debt, which is a whole other issue for our society, under the theocracy, and we're not a theocracy, but under the theocracy of Israel, if you had a debt you could not pay back, you were to go, for example, if I had a debt that I owed Shannon, she's not my wife, I would have to serve her to pay off the debt or until what? Seven years or until Jubilee came around. Jubilee expunged all debts. Okay? And if I had to sell family inheritance of land in order to pay her or to give her the land, at Jubilee I could get that land back. Okay? Because it expunged all debts. All right? But in the meantime, I could do that. But let's say that I work for her for seven years and she's good to me. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to work for anybody else then I can volunteer to be her servant. But it's a volunteer. I volunteer to do that. And the way that I would do it is you would put a ring in my ear. Or you put a hole in my ear. Right? And it was a sign of what? I'm not my own. I, I serve somebody else. That's the concept that Paul uses when he writes. Whenever you see Paul write uh, in the New Testament, Paul, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the concept. Paul says that we are a debtor to God because of grace. And what did Paul call himself? I am a doulos. I am what? I have given myself to him and I have let him what? Put a ring in my ear because I'm his. I don't want to serve anybody else. Can I tell you something? We ought to be the same. For you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And we ought to go to him and say, I'm yours. I'm yours. You're good to me. I love you. I can trust you. I know you're going to be good to me. See what I'm saying? We don't want that. What we want is a buddy. What we want is a genie in a bottle. I'm in a mess. Get me out of this. Uh-uh. No. You own me. I don't have a will of my own. I don't have a life of my own. Man. That destroys the concept of Sunday only, doesn't it? It also empowers the church. It empowers the church to be his servant. Because if you're his servant, he's obligated himself to take care of you. If you want to be his employee, then that means you're responsible to take care of yourself. Oh, I'll give you my Sunday. Okay, well, you've got to take care of Monday through Saturday. I'd rather be his doulos, wouldn't you? Because he's got to take care of me. And he will take care of me. That'll preach. All right, all right. Uh, let's see here. Um, oh, uh, Japhath. Japhath was to be blessed with enlargement. In other words, his tent would spread. All right. From this, uh, he was to dwell in the tents of Sham. There'd be a special relationship between Sham and Japhath. Canaan was also to be his servant. The subsequent history of the human race illustrates that the Japhatic races were given large parts of the earth to dwell and were blessed in them. Here's a way to think about it. Remember what you studied in world history as a kid? All of those nations in what, Europe? The Germans, the French, the British. What did they do? They occupied large portions of the world. They were educated financially prosperous and all of that, all right? And then what do they do? They explore. They send explorers around the world to South America, Central America, 
to North America, right? Their tent was enlarged, okay? And these are just some of the prophecies that come out of this uh, in those three uh, sons. All of the human race comes out of them. Um, trying to see if there's something else I need to share. By the way, the, the, the hope of the uh, Noahic covenant is going to be fulfilled in the future. Because what's God's going to, what's God, what God is going to do is he is going to preserve his creation in order to fulfill his redemption, not only of the human race, but also of the whole created order. All right? And so basically what God did in common grace is he made it possible for his creation to sustain human life in order to redeem his people. Does that make sense? I mean, if God destroyed everything, including Noah and his families, there's no redemption. Human race is over, okay? But God promised to what? Be benevolent and good to the human race in order to propagate races and peoples and generations going on and on and on until he accomplished his purpose. And I want you to think about this right here. He, and it's mind-boggling, and, and I don't have all of the answers for it, but the book of Ephesians says that he chose you before the foundation of the world. And he predestined you to the adoption as children in love. God sustained the human race through Ham, Sham, and Japheth and his redemptive plan through Abraham and all the covenants that we're going to see in order to get to you to save you. Now, if you want something to humble you, think about that. We get tied up in minutia of things that don't matter and things that are temporary. You've got to get a worldview that your God is sovereign and that he sustains everything and that he is working his purposes, that you are his, and that he has a plan for you. Let me say this and I'll, I'll let you go. While I'm not worried about climate change or trying to spend trillions of dollars to find another place to live, I do have a responsibility to be a good steward of what God has given us. You don't need to hunt animals until they're extinct. That's bad stewardship. You don't need to throw your trash out the window. This is your home. It's God's place for you you don't need to put pollutants into rivers have y'all seen any of the studies you go on youtube and type plastic in the pacific ocean we ought to be ashamed yeah we ought to be ashamed of what we've done now let me say this because i've traveled enough of the world what what kind of makes me a little angry is those in charge play on the ignorance of people. One of the cleanest nations in the world is the United States. Go to Eastern Europe. Yeah, go to Haiti. I promise you, you will be amazed at just the filth. You know, and, and some, of those, some of those places. But then again, I think they're doing some marvelous work over there here lately. They have really amped it up. They've done some amazing things. But I'm, t I'm telling you, we do need to be good stewards of it because it's not mine. I'm passing this on to my grandson. I'm passing this on to his grandson. I am responsible. Now, here's the thing that I want to say about that is, as believers, we shouldn't be contrary to people who want to be eco-sensitive. We just have to find a balance in that. We ought to be partnering with them. It doesn't have to be an either or. 
right? Right? I mean, I drive up here sometimes to this mall and am just frustrated because it is trashy. Trashy. That's one reason why I want another place. Because I can't fix that by myself, and apparently some people don't care to fix it. I mean, anyway, I don't want to get off on that. Okay. All right, that's your Noahic covenant. It's a big deal. It has ramifications for your life today, and it's a connecting point with this world, even lost people, to let them know it's a common grace. Okay? All right. I appreciate you being here tonight. You guys have a great evening.